Hello, and welcome to Black Thoughts, a new project by Podcasting is Praxis. I'm James, and these episodes are going to be released on no particular schedule. Instead, they're going to come up whenever a thought arises that I think is worth exploring, either because it's just occurred to me, or because someone has asked. So, what is Black Thoughts? Put simply, it is an anarchist's take on the issues of the day. And now note how I say that, an anarchist. I don't claim to speak for all anarchists, and I don't claim to be able to give you a really strong universal definition of anarchism. In fact, I think by definition that's probably impossible. What I merely mean to do is try and give you a little bit of insight into how I see the world. For you to do with whatever you wish. You can disagree with me if you like, you can agree, uh, you can decide to make it the basis for your own political philosophy, or you can decide I'm talking complete shit and it's worth a seven hour response video. I don't care. It's up to you. Make of this what you will. With that in mind, I want to lay a couple of ground rules. My intention for this is to make sure that I don't come into this from a high theory perspective, where I assume people have done a lot of background reading. In fact, I'm going to go out of my way to try and explain things such that you don't have to have done any reading, nor are you particularly prompted to go away and do any reading. I think that the biggest barrier to people understanding a lot of the concepts which float around in left circles is their presentation and is this kind of assumption of academia and of people being, shall we say, shut away in libraries for hours at a time, reading about subjects which are written in a very boring and inaccessible way. I don't want that. And I think you don't want that either. I think you just want to get a handle on the ideas that fundamentally drive left thought. And honestly, I think it's far more important to have a working grasp of the things that matter, to integrate them into your day-to-day -day lives, into your ways of viewing and thinking about the world. I think that's much more important than being able to quote the names of famous authors or to be able to recite passages from memory. I can't do any of that, genuinely. Uh, many of the books I've read, I cannot remember who wrote them. I have to struggle and I have to go and look them up. Similarly, I could not memorise quotations to save myself. But I can paraphrase them. I do understand what the theories mean. And I can, if need be, go and find the receipts, if you will, to back up what I'm talking about. And I think that's a way to be, and I think that's a way to approach this. So, with that all said and done, this first inaugural episode is about class, and specifically, the British relationship to class. So, let's talk about it. That's pure class, mate. That's a phrase I've heard from time to time. I've also heard people refer to things as being classy, you know? What do we actually mean when we use that phrase? And what does it tell us about our actual relationship to class? What even is class? Why, why is class such a fundamentally determinative fact of your trajectory in British life? More so than in America or in many other countries. So let's, let's start with really simple stuff. Let's start with Karl Marx's theory of class. See what I did there? Yeah. I'm going to talk about the communist theory of class articulated by Marx. Now, this is orthodox Marxism, i.e. Marxism that's very close to what Karl Marx himself originally wrote when he was writing about communism and about his theories underpinning the necessity and inevitability of communism. Because Marxists have a very particular view of what class is, and it's largely spread from there to encompass a lot of the attitudes on the left towards class. The problem is, as an anarchist, I think they're wrong. I think they've made a mistake. And to explain what that mistake is, I have to talk about the original version of class as articulated by Karl Marx. So, let's do that. Under the Marxist interpretation of class, your class is wholly determined by your relationship to material conditions. What do we mean by material conditions? We basically mean how you physically materially live, how you relate to society through a material lens, what resources are at your command and at your disposal, what do you depend upon versus what can you put to bear, bring to bear on anything that confronts you. The people who are uh, shall we say, better established in material conditions, um, have more power than those who are, shall we say, dispossessed of material conditions. Um, and more fundamental than this, 
your relationship to how material conditions are established is your class under Marxism. So what do I mean by that? Well, Marx has this, this wonderful phrase called the means of production. And what this literally means is the method or the way in which society produces the material goods it uses. The means of production is the industrial capacity and, and other capacities necessary for the flourishing and propagation of society. It's the, the backbone and lifeblood on which society runs. It's the actual work that takes place, right? So the means of production, how you relate to that determines your class, according to Marx, and by extension determines your material conditions, essentially. So he, he formulated the following two basic definitions. If you relate to the means of production such that you derive your living and your place in society and you derive your material conditions from ownership of the means of production, that is, you don't do the work yourself, but others work for you by virtue of you owning the tools they use, owning the land they use, owning the business that they operate under, then you are bourgeoisie, or perhaps, shall we say, a good capitalist. On the other hand, if in order to survive you must work, if you must engage with the means of production in order to produce your life and your living, then you're a member of a proletariat. Then you are someone who has to labour for a living. And this was the this at its root, at its core, is the fundamental basis of all Marxist thought and thought that proceeds from Marxism. This idea that there are material conditions, that we have modes of production that produce these material conditions, and your relationship to those modes is what determines both what material conditions you get out of the mode of production and also your position within society. To boil it down, if you are a worker or if you are a boss, that determines how you are in the world. And thus it makes sense to group people according to that specification and, crucially, for revolutionary potential, for the ability to maybe change the world, it's important to organise along those lines. Here's the thing, though, that, that basic definition didn't quite cut it. And if you're quick, you'll have probably spotted there is an immediate problem here. What about people who... They do own things, they do derive income from owning things, but it's not enough and they still have to work as well. What about someone who, say, owns a shop, and they themselves work in that shop while also hiring people to work for them? And yes, they're making a profit from the labour of the people who work in the shop, but they themselves are also working in the shop. Are they proletariat or are they bourgeoisie? And... Marx's solution was to develop a, an intermediate step, if you will, called the petit bourgeoisie, or the little shopkeeper, which literally means someone who is partially engaged in the capitalist relationship to the means of production, but they also in themselves have to still labour. And I'd actually put it to you, there's an awful lot of people today who would potentially fall into that category. They're well-paid professionals who perhaps have investments or similar things going on, but they themselves are still forced to labour. All right? So, okay, this, this seems like it solves a problem, except now it still doesn't quite, because this is exclusionary of a whole lot of, of lived human experience. What about the people who don't have a relationship to the mode of production in society, to the means of production, if you will. Um, what about the people who, shall we say, live off charity, who are beggars in one form or another, or sustained by others? The people who themselves don't work. What about criminals? People who create nothing and yet are able to make a living by essentially squeezing the people who do. There's actually quite a few different categories of people that don't fit into this schema. And Marx, in his first instance, took a long, hard look at them, and he decided to write them off. He actually came up with a category of people called the lumpen proletariat. And these were the people, a catch-all term for the people who didn't have a relationship or necessarily established themselves in relation to the means of production. 
and by consequence, um, he considered him to have n little to no revolutionary potential. Because, I mean, it makes sense. If you're looking to organize people along the lines of their relationship to the means of production, well, someone who doesn't really have a proper relationship to the means of production, they can't be organized, can they? They, they have no ability to relate to the things you're trying to use as your endpoint to get them to realize how screwed they are. Now, if this sounds to you like Marx made a bit of a critical error here, if he constrained himself unnecessarily to seeing the direct participation in the means of production of society um, to the exclusion of the dispossessed and the revolutionary potential that might exist there, you're correct. And many others have thought so as well. And there's been a lot of socialist thought to try and correct that error, including in his later life from Marx himself. Won't get into that. It's not worth going down that particular route. The problem is that the underlying assumption still remains. And in leftist circles, people genuinely consider class in almost black and white terms of relationship to material conditions. And they don't really think about the other side of things because there is another side. And it was kind of implied at the start there when I talked about something being classy or of describing something as that's class. There is another component to class beyond your relationship to material conditions. There is status. There is the part which anarchists care about, which is status and power. And these things do not fall neatly within the realm of materialism. They are not possibly reduced to mere atoms, to an arrangement of scientific fact. We should really talk a little bit more about that. There's a quote by the author Terry Pratchett who wrote a whole bunch of fantasy that I come back to from time to time. It's from a passage in a book he wrote called Hogfather, and I think it's actually quite profound for such a, you know, silly little fantasy series, as many people would call it. I'm going to read it to you. All right, said Susan. I'm not stupid. You're saying humans need fantasies to make life bearable. Really? As if it was some kind of pink pill? No. Humans need fantasy to be human, to be the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape. Two fairies, hogfathers, little, yes, as practice. You have to start out learning to believe the little lies, so we can believe the big ones. Yes, justice, mercy, duty, that sort of thing. They're not the same at all. You think so? Then take the universe and grind it down to the finest powder and sieve it through the finest sieve and then show me one atom of justice, one molecule of mercy. That sticks with me. That is in my mind a lot of the time when I read what is written by orthodox Marxists and those who proceed from them. Because the fundamental nature of society is that it's constituted from the social relations and the material conditions of the people who live in it. I'm not saying that the Marxist analysis of how the things in society, the physicalities that we all live and die by, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm not saying they don't matter. But I am saying they're not all of how people think about the world. And in fact, in fact... Most of the time, people aren't thinking about them at all. People are thinking about other things, things which aren't, in the scientific sense, true. They aren't scientific fact. There's an interesting aside we could have talking about science and about what it means for something to be scientific fact and what we consider to be scientific truth and how we arrive at that definition and how often in our modern society it's twisted for ideological ends. We'll do that another time, I think. But what's important to come to is, is this fundamental truth, as I see it, this reality, that there are things in human life that are simply constructs of human social relations, the things that we value, that we hold as important, which don't have a real material basis. And they might 
find representation in the material world. They might have consequence in the material world, but they're not wholly confined to or arising from it. Now, you might get some people who think that at fundamental levels we are all just, you know, biological machines, that we live in a universe where eventually we'll be able to explain why people do the things they do, the way they do them, by the interaction of molecules bouncing around in their brains. But, unfortunately, science itself says this isn't really truly the case, that actually when you really drill right down, things are a lot greyer, and that perfect prediction is more or less impossible. So you're left with this large grey area, this gap which will never actually be closed wholly, not to the satisfaction of a human need to recognise patterns. And so we have to contend with the fact that there are parts of human life which cannot be reduced by any immortal science to something we can put our hands on and grasp and say, yes, it is category A or category B. And our social relations, how we organise ourselves, how we relate to each other, the moods and whims and petty jealousies and rivalries and loves which arrange us all, they are not so neat as to be specified by this classification of class that's been produced. You need another framework, you need another way to approach the topic, something which isn't rooted wholly in material conditions but does make allowance for them. And this is where I come to things. This is the perspective I come from. Essentially, class, as I see it, is partially about your relationship to material conditions, but it's a two-way street. Your relationship to material conditions is determined by factors beyond the circumstances, the material circumstances in which you find yourself. In fact, the social element of this is the very thing which can change, can transform how you relate to material conditions. Any accounting of class which ignores this other component is acting in a vacuum, and it's a poor predictor of human behaviour. And I think, and here is my deepest contention, that leftist politics are held back by not really being able to grapple with this because they constrain themselves to this framework of it's all material conditions, it's all black and white. And nowhere is this more prominent, I think, than in class as it exists in the United Kingdom. Because class, as it turns out, well, they actually tell us, you know, our society, UK society, they actually tell us what the working definition of class is. And it's exclusionary and incomplete, but it is very telling of how your average British person relates to class. What on earth am I talking about? Well, the UK Office for National Statistics engages in what's called the National Statistics Socioeconomic Classification System. And there is an actual schedule, a scheme, by which they assign people letters and numbers to determine their socioeconomic classification, their class, right? I'm going to read it to you because it tells you a lot about how British people are assumed to see the world. We'll start with Group 1, which is higher professional and managerial occupations. They're given an equivalent under the NRS scheme, don't ask me, called A. Group 2, lower managerial and professional occupations, are B. Group 3 are intermediate occupations, that's given the definition C1 and C2. Group 4 are small employers and own account workers, that's also C1 and C2. Group 5 is lower supervisory and technical occupations, that's C1 and C2. Group 6 is semi-routine occupations, that's D. 7 is routine occupations, that's D. And Group 8 are never worked and for long-term unemployed, they are Group E. Now, listening to that, you might think, oh, well, that seems like it's broadly related to the material conditions and where they find themselves purchased within them. But I put it to you that actually it's not as simple as one following the other, that it is a reciprocal kind of arrangement. And the clue to this lies in those middle bands. Listen to this. Intermediate occupations, small employers or own account workers, lower supervisory and technical occupations. They're all C1, C2, right? And then semi-routine and routine occupations, they're all D. And then when you drill down into the actual classifications, and how they try and put them together, you start to realise that the 
NRS social grades, as they're called, um, that were originally developed with a national readership survey to classify their readers, these are very telling of how people look at themselves. They actually have a translation. The classifications were originally based on the occupation of the head of the household. Well, that's interesting. A, upper middle class, with a higher managerial roles, administrative or professional. B, the middle middle class, with the intermediate managerial roles, administrative or professional. C1, the lower middle class, supervisory or clerical and junior managerial roles, administrative or professional. C2, the skilled working class, were skilled manual workers. D was working class, semi-skilled and unskilled manual workers. E was non-working, which included state pensioners, casual and lowest grade workers, and unemployed with state benefits only. And taken together, A, B, C, 1 would be middle class, C, 2, D, E would be working class, respectively. And the classification scheme, you'll have noticed, excludes upper class. Because why would you need to determine your exact placement within the upper class? Isn't it enough to be upper class? And here we arrive at the root of this, what I'm driving at. The reason I've just bored you with all this technical tedium for a system which, as I admitted right at the start, it isn't sufficient to capture the reality of class. What these systems reveal is a preoccupation with where one stands in relationship to others. If you're in the upper class, then the teeming masses beneath you don't really matter. All that matters is that they're distinct from you and you're distinct from them. And everything else is about personal relationships, because remember, the upper class are relatively quite small and everyone really does know each other at the uppermost levels. That's how it works. It's the lower levels, the lower steps of the bloody pyramid, that sees a lot of competition for people trying to climb it, and where it's very important to know exactly where you stand in comparison with your neighbours, the Joneses. In this situation, you desperately care whether you're grade B or grade A, whether you're C1 or, dear God, falling off into the lower rungs of C2, D and E, the dreaded working class. Because, and I put it to you, dear listener here, Class isn't really about your material relations. That's a component of it, and it's an important one when it comes to industrial organising and unions and similar. But class as experienced by your everyday person is really about social status. It's about how you stack up in comparison to the others in your lives. It's about what clout you can bring to bear in social situations and how you are treated by society as a whole, and in particular by the powers of society, and what power you presumably have. And this is where anarchism has a lot to say, where my anarchism has a lot to say at least, again I can't speak for all anarchists, because anarchism is concerned with the dynamics of power, how power relationships are categorised and organised, and how they function in practice. I can talk a lot about, for example, the relationship between tenant and landlord, and I can talk about it not just in terms of material conditions, but also in terms of how the social arrangement of those two figures plays out to impact upon material arrangements, and how it actually imposes limits on organisation. For example, you can campaign until you're blue in the face to get certain protection for tenants, but in practice, tenants often will not be able to take advantage of them because of the social dynamic at work with their landlord. Everyone knows that if your landlord doesn't like you, it doesn't matter what the protections in the law say, they can find a way to fuck with you. And that's the reality of the thing. That is the de facto reality, quite separate from the de jure analysis. And often, yes, there is a problem. You, not all landlords are created equal. As many of us have experienced over our lives, there is a big difference between a corporate landlord, a small-time landlord, a landlord who is relying on the property for their pension. It materially impacts on how the relationship plays out. And you might say, well, that again, the landlords you've just described, their material relations are what defines how things play out in practice, but that excludes their actual individual status arrangements. For example, 
if in society you are white, able-bodied, and male, you have a much easier time of it than if you are white, able-bodied, and female. It manifestly changes your relationship to material conditions. Ah, yes, well, that's the misogynistic component of material conditions. Well, no, it's the misogynistic component of status relationships. And this is the real kind of thing. I mean, you know, we all heard about Karens, white women, and predominantly starting in the States, but I mean, they're everywhere, aren't they? Who are able to throw tantrums and frequently get their way because they play upon the status they're afforded as white women of a certain class background. That's how it works. Increasingly, they're getting upset because they're finding that actually they're not being afforded the status that they have been conditioned to expect. It's about status, and it's about how society accords status, and to who, and in what limited context that status is usable. Because what do we actually mean when we talk about status? You know, it, obviously it's a distinguisher, someone of higher status, lower status. We're really talking about the capacity to wield power, an abstract form of power, a power which is, again, very subjective based on the status disparity and based on context. But it really is about power at its root. And it doesn't necessarily map perfectly with material conditions. Now, why does this matter? Well, it certainly matters for our approach to people politically. Let's have a little think about it and talk about it a little further. We've seen in our daily lives, people being accorded more or less respect based on what they do. And we've also seen within our lifetimes, we've witnessed different professions gain or lose respect from society. And we've also seen different groups of people relating to different occupations in a different way. For example, the reality is that many, many doctors in the United Kingdom, although they have great potential for lifetime earnings, Let's be real, at the start, they're actually pretty significantly in debt. Their relationship to material conditions are, I would argue, firmly proletariat at the start. Because they are required to work, and if they don't work, they're going to be eaten alive by various debts they've had to accrue as part of the very intensive training they've undergone. Yet this is okay, because longer term those doctors will eventually become consultants and from the money they're paid, they'll do very well for themselves. And yet we don't really divide these doctors into different classifications along material lines. They are one profession, and that one profession is accorded the same status. Now, you can argue about how justified that status is. I personally think that someone who devotes their life to healing others is worthy of some degree of respect. But the status that comes with it is a very different thing, isn't it? We all know that when a doctor makes a complaint to the police or similar, it's taken much more seriously than when a street cleaner does. We all know that when a doctor weighs in on an issue, it's taken much more seriously than when a school teacher does. We all know that when a doctor is in the room and being dealt with, we know about it because they are allowed the status signifier of calling themselves doctor. A status signifier we only usually otherwise reserve for people who've completed particularly rigorous and intensive academic achievements. It's interesting, isn't it, that status that's accorded to doctors and what it actually translates to, even when their actual relationship to material conditions, in the immediate sense, is perhaps actually pretty poor. And it's also a fact, by the way, that not all doctors go on to become consultants. That's kind of assumed, but no, they don't. Many doctors end up working as doctors for most of their lives in one form or another. And you never really hear about the ones who burn out, drop out, or change professions. You tend not to think about that, but it does happen. It happens more often than we'd like to admit. What's happening here is, well, Marx would say that the actual true material relations are being, shall we say, hidden by some kind of 
mistaken belief, some false consciousness. And false consciousness is a term that gets used a lot in Marxist circles to describe basically when people are thinking the wrong thing and have the wrong view of the world and that false consciousness must be broken and they must be brought into it, the true materialist view of how social relations unfold and proceed. But this is a bit of a cop-out, isn't it? I mean, it's good propaganda, don't get me wrong, you know? Insisting that your view of the world is right to the exclusion of all others, to the contemplation of all others, and coming up with an easy in-group term to describe you know, these wrong thinks is a, is a good way to go about kind of getting people converted to your cause. Problem is that I'm not convinced it's correct, really, to say that the people who allow their view of class to be swayed by other inputs are essentially operating under a kind of political false consciousness. Actually, I think they can be working under a very rational consciousness under uh, uh, actually more accurate consciousness than the Marxist view of things. And it ties back to what I was talking about earlier when I talked uh, about Terry Pratchett and I read that short quotation. The simple truth is that when it comes to social relations, if enough people believe something that's purely within the social realm, that thing becomes socially true. Now, I can find it to social relations because obviously, you know, material fact at its root, is not subject to public opinion. I mean, we can talk a lot about the you know opinions that go into science and settled scientific consensus, but if you work under the assumption that we establish things empirically through scientific testing, there are a whole category of things which are material and which you can't argue with. You cannot argue with the tensile strength of particular grades of steel, for example. It's just objective fact. But whether someone is good or bad, or whether they are nice or a villain, these things are not so easily established. In fact, they are the settled opinion of individuals, and taken en masse, the settled opinion of individuals becomes the settled opinion of society. Which is to say, the social relations of individuals sum together to produce the social relations of society. And those social relations are organised in status competitions, in one way or another, in the current way we live. And so your person on the street who makes their political decisions based on status rather than on material conditions is in many ways being quite rational. You could say they're adopting a bad strategy, that actually they would be better served individually to consider the material conditions are in and how those might be improved by, say, socialist policy. But you're making value judgments about what they care about. Let's go back to that grading from before. C1, lower middle class. C2, skilled working class. Seems trivial, doesn't it? In fact, a Marxist would say there really isn't that much of a distinction, distinction between the, the working class and the middle class, that these are both just false constructs that are meant to turn people against each other. Except they're not. Because a middle class person gets many more breaks from society than a working class person. A middle class person might be precarious in many situations, but at least they're not working class. At least they have that in how they are treated and how they hold themselves, on which they can constitute their identity. Anything but be working class. When they talk to the police as a nice middle class person, they don't face the same oppression as a working class person does. And you might say, well, this is part of the trap of society. And I would agree. I would agree. I think that status is a poison. But status is how people in the UK really think about class. And they assess policies and politics put to them, not by their material conditions directly, though that does factor in. They first and foremost look at them through the assault and threat that these changes might pose to their status positions. I think that one of the reasons many voters rejected the Labour platform under Jeremy Corbyn wasn't because it would make their lives worse and they didn't believe it, etc, etc, etc. That's all after the fact sort of stuff. That's all justification for beliefs they already came to. The real problem is that by proposing the many versus the few, what Jeremy Corbyn's Labour were essentially doing was they were taking a whole bunch of people and looping them all in with the huddled masses of the working class. They were essentially saying they wanted to dismantle the class system. 
which sounds objectively good if you're already on board, but if you care about status, if you are in that world, if you are policing your place within it, that's a threat. That's dire poison. That is something that looks to take away what you have, what you constitute yourself upon. And potentially, potentially for some, dismantle your eventual ability to climb up that pyramid even further to finally make it to the upper class. That's a threat. And it's a threat to even many in the working class whose great dream is to not be working class anymore. Do you know, the most insufferable middle class people I've met in Britain have been people who started off as working class. And yet, and yet, it also works in another insidious way, and this is the other missing component of all of this. Obviously, the successes of the broad labour movement in the United Kingdom, and I don't mean the political party, they are such that they have changed the relationship with class in much of society, particularly in the media, who have recognised that the nascent pride in working class background that was brought together by the previous labour movement, that has to be paid lip service to. That has to be something that is respected and that is, um, shall we say, performed in order to maintain the status hierarchy as it currently exists. As it's constituted in the UK, coming from a working class is perfectly acceptable as long as you don't behave as a member of a working class, unless unless it's in a context in which you are usefully speaking for the working class or to the working class to keep them working class. And when you put all this together, you have a picture of a modern British relationship to class. Material conditions are a secondary concern. Wealth matters, but class overrides all. And in fact, if you have wealth, but you are still behaving in a way that is considered gauche, then I'm sorry, your class has not changed. But that's okay, depending on your particular political arrangements. For example, you can be working class in your mannerisms, behaviours, and your interests and your tastes, etc, etc, and have wealth, and still be considered all right if you are utilising that in a propaganda way that is, is useful to the interests that rule society. This is why you have politicians and figures in business who are uncritically called working class. And people genuinely believe to be working class because the power and the money are secondary to these other signifiers that are used to determine status position. In the United Kingdom, how you perform your class is how people determine where you belong in the overall class hierarchy. If you speak with a received pronunciation, which that wasn't, <laughs> but seriously, if you if you speak in a received pronunciation way, if you can reference the right cultural shibboleths, that is a, a means for distinguishing an in-group versus an out-group. If you can do these things, you're accorded a higher class position than if you can't, if you don't get the references, if you have a very common or northern accent. This is the means by which class is policed on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, of course it has to be, because fundamentally it's all just white turfs for the most part in the United Kingdom, isn't it? It's how they perform their class that determines where they fall. And then, yes, it is followed up by other signifiers which are gated by already being in the class. For example, if you are middle class, you've got a middle class job, you can afford middle class expenditure to get certain middle class things which are considered emblematic of being in the middle class. And so by these methods, people are able to police who's actually in the middle class. First, they examine their status signifiers in the performance, and then they look at the material conditions to see, well, are they actually in the middle class or are they faking it? That's a very common thing, and it's one of the things the middle classes do with each other an awful lot. And only then, only after establishing whether someone is in a class or not, does one determine how one relates to them, how useful they potentially are or not. It's very interesting to see it at work in the artistic community, if you will, of the United Kingdom. It's, uh, it's very fierce, very, very fierce. People are always sizing up how useful they are to each other, but also where they fall in the class continuum. 
and they're all very careful, I've found, to guard class induction into higher echelons, particularly particularly the upper-class artists I've encountered. But thereby hangs another tale. So, what do we come down to? This rambling introduction, this first collection of black thoughts, this first thundercloud, is really just a suggestion to you to have a think about how class is really constituted and about how political parties and their actions can be taken from that framework of class, from that framework of status and of threats to status. That, I think, is the core of British identity. And yes, the things which class and status are attached to are deeply regressive, authoritarian, and frankly rooted in dreams of an empire that died long ago. And there's all that particular disease we could go into when talking about normal Ireland. But the general functioning thing is not all material. It's not all about the money in your bank account. It is about signifiers of where you stand in status relative to each other. That is the first and foremost introduction to class that everyone in this country has. That's why people, when they see things which they think are pretty good or that look good or that change your status signifier, they will say it's classy. They will call something class when it's particularly good, as in fine quality. That's what class is in the United Kingdom. And talking about material conditions, talking about how policy is going to benefit people, that's only ever going to appeal to the people right on the bottom. And it's only going to appeal to them if they have no dreams of climbing up that pyramid, if they've got no dreams of changing their class. That's it for Black Thoughts. I hope this was interesting to you. I hope you got some benefit from it. Um, At some point, I'll do another one of these. It's not going to be a regular thing. Patrons will get early access, so if you want to hear them before everyone else, then please join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash praxiscast. You're very welcome. We have bonus episodes. We have a Discord server where you can join and ask my opinion on stuff. And if it's something that I think I can talk on from an anarchist perspective, from an anarchist's perspective, then I'll do one of these. Still, that's all for this week. Thank you all very much. I look forward to speaking to you in future. The music is used with permission by RJD2. Take care.